I'm Cliff Strain, the director of the Port Aransas Preservation Historical Association, which we are trying to shorten to Preservation Association. Uh, this is our winter lecture series, and uh, we'll be going, continuing then until February 3rd. Uh, I think it's the 19th is the last one, and that's the one that we had to cancel because of the ice a couple weeks ago. Next week is going to be the Coast Guard. Uh, I'd like to thank our, our volunteers and board members and Ashley Harris, who's back there in the kitchen, has been there since about 3 o'clock working on getting the snacks ready. And uh, she's also our C COO, uh, Chief Operating Officer. And also, uh, we have quite a few volunteers. I'd like uh, all the volunteers and board members who are also volunteers uh, to please raise your hand so you know people know who you are. And I don't know where Claudia is, but Harold's back there in the vest. There are uh, highlighted uh, volunteers of the, of the month. So I thought I'd point that out. They do, they do a tremendous amount of work for us every, year after year. And uh, our volunteers uh, at the Museum of the Farley Boat Works are great people to talk to if you are interested in being part of our many uh, events and programs. Today's lecture is uh, The Ghost Towns of Copano Bay, and it's by Pam Wheat Stranahan. I don't think you're going to find a more qualified speaker on any archaeological subject in this area. As a matter of fact, I had to make the uh, title of the, our flyer really small to fit all her accolades, even after reducing them down to, to just 12 on the number of, uh, for the font. She uh, retired as an executive director of the Texas Archaeological Association in 2010 after eight years. Before, she was Director of Education at Houston Museum of Natural Science and the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center in Cortez, Colorado. Stranahan was, a, was the Education Coordinator for LaSalle Shipwreck Project, which is a really exciting project. We've got a YouTube video. Uh, there's a, a National Geographic special on that. It was a really pretty incredible project. And that was with the Texas Historic Commission. Uh, so she was involved dur right even during the, as early as during the, evac the uh, excavation of the LaBelle, La 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 which was a ship that went down in Matagorda Bay. And it was really quite a, uh, an engineering feat building a Kofer Dam, and, and they had people visiting the, the project regularly while they were excavating. So pretty, pretty neat project to be involved with. She served on the founding board for the Museum of the Coastal Bend in Victoria, Texas. She also serves on boards for the Aransas County Historical Society, the Aransas County Historical Commission, and the Historical Center, <coughs> receiving its Volunteer of the Year Award in 2022. In 2024, she received the Ruth Lester Lifetime Achievement Award from the Texas Historic Commission. 2004, backing up a little bit, she was awarded the Society for American Archaeological Award for Excellence in Public Education. And uh, one last thing, uh, as, as far as citizenry, in 2013, Stranahan was named Citizen of the Year by the Rockport Fulton Chamber of Commerce. And in 2011, was made a Fellow of the Texas Archaeological Society for her contributions in archaeology. So, she comes very well recommended by many, many organizations. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over at this point to our guest speaker, Pam Wheat Stranahan. Cliff, I guess those of you who are in the audience that also serve as volunteers just mean I've got what we call helium hand, right? <laughs> I volunteer for a lot of projects, but I've certainly always enjoyed them. And my love is history and archaeology. The archaeology just falls in with the history. And what you'll see tonight is some of the things that I have uh, learned uh, since we moved to this area about 20, almost 25 years ago now. Uh, when we moved here from Houston, I really had no inkling of what was here in this area. 
and yet it is one of the most historic. It has some of the most interesting history that you'll ever want to see. So I'm going to relate just a little bit of that tonight. So first of all, let me jump back and remind you that our first visitors to the coast uh, were the Karankawa Indians. And uh, here you have a band of Copano Indians, okay, or Copan. It turns out that the uh, fellows, the Spanish who were mapping the coast, came along and they looked at the bay and what did they see out here but a row of dugout canoes. In Spanish, that word was Copanate. And so they were having to name all the inlets, all the bays that they saw as they were going along making these maps for Spain. So they just called our bay Copan, okay? So you see that when you're over, especially over in Rockport, you'll see this name uh, frequently. It was given by the Spanish uh, to our bay, and I'm gonna talk about that primarily. Uh, so this first fellow who really named everything was Pineda, and he came along and he mapped the whole Texas coast, well, the Gulf Coast, actually. He started in Florida and went all the way to Veracruz because they were already had foundations, towns in the Veracruz area. The next uh, person that we credit with being an explorer in the area was Cabeza de Vaca. Some of you probably know his story, but he was here in 1528. And um, fortunately, after he got back home, he wrote uh, his memoirs, and so we have a lot of information about both the early uh, inhabitants that he encountered and the environment that he also uh, saw. The next set uh, that's really interesting to me is a 1554 shipwreck. If you've been to Corpus Christi, to the Science, Muse Science and History Museum there, you've seen a display about these shipwrecks. These shipwrecks wrecked on Padre Island. I love this picture. This is a sketch that shows when they, they came back to try to salvage what was uh, the shipwreck. And they came back to salvage it because guess what it had on it? Oh, yeah, gold. No, not gold. Silver, though, okay? <laughs> so this was a fleet of ships that uh, were going from Mexico to Spain. They actually stopped off in Havana and then on over to Spain. But this was a fleet of shipwrecks that um, got caught in a hurricane. Uh, one of them made it onto Havana, and so they knew the other, something had happened to the others. Um, with this shipwreck, some of the people survived, walked back to Mexico, floated and walked. They sort of used floats to, uh, uh, to get back, but uh, they knew that they needed to come back and look for those ships that had sunk. So there were two ships that sunk off of Padre Island, and then when some work was being done to create a cut through uh, Padre Island down at Mansfield, they hit these um, shipwrecks again. It also there was an interesting case here. There was um, a salvage company that came in and started diving on these shipwrecks. And it caused a lot of concern here in Texas because they were not from Texas. They were not putting the objects into a museum. And so they were sued by the state of Texas. And uh, the state of Texas won half of the plunder that they'd gotten. But it also caused the state of Texas to create a law that said, you know, we control, because we were a country, we control our sea border 12 miles out. And so anything within that 12 mile range is Texas property, not, not anybody that comes along. Like Florida does not have this rule. So any of you who've been to or traveled in Florida and seen shipwrecks that have been uh, worked by um, people who were not from the government or from a university, uh, that's a different rule, but here in Texas we do have that now because of this shipwreck that was right here in our neighborhood in Padre Island. Um, then uh, Cliff already mentioned La Salle. He was a Frenchman uh, who came uh, trying to uh, actually find the Mississippi River and set up a fort there because he'd convinced Louis that um, this would be the best way to control the territory. France already had territory up in Canada, or called New France at the time. And those of you from the Midwest probably are very familiar with La Salle and have many references to him around the Great Lakes uh, and even down on the Mississippi River. So he had made a, a journey down the Mississippi River to the Gulf of Mexico. 
he didn't have the right kind of navigational tools, so he was not able to get his horizontal location. He only had his vertical location. So um, he convinced the king to give him some ships. He came back trying to find the mouth of the Mississippi. He came in January. It was cloudy. It was foggy. And he missed the mouth of the Mississippi. It's no wonder because it's just marsh by the time you see it out on the Gulf. Uh, he came on down through tech, through along the coast of Texas and um, decided he needed to stop over at Matagorda. If those of you know where that is, a little bit north of here. Um, he thought maybe there was a river that came into it, but not much, just a creek. But um, he had started out with four ships. One ship was captured by the Spanish pirates before he ever got to the Caribbean. Another ship was just a French Navy ship, and its only duty was to get them here and then turn around and go back. So that ship left with a few people that were a little disgruntled. Uh, a third ship um, was a small ship, the Bell, and it was made just to be able to come into shallow waters. So it scooted into Matagorda Bay, and then the big supply ship was supposed to follow it. Um, that captain didn't do a very good job, and he grounded, and that ship broke up. So it was all started with four ships, and he ends up with one in Matagorda Bay. And they lived there for a couple or three years, and uh, then a big storm comes up and sinks that last ship, the Bell. This is an imaginary uh, sketch of what his colony might have looked like, and he really never called it Fort St. Louis. It was always just the settlement but uh, later historians gave the name of Fort to this area. Um, after the excavation of the Bell, the Texas Historic Commission went back onto some land uh, where some cannon had been found and were able to actually define the outlines of all of those buildings. They really weren't um, anything that you would consider some, uh, a venue that you'd want to go visit. They were just shacks. There was only one building that maybe uh, was a two-story building uh, and with a chapel, uh, but the rest of them were just covered with brush or hides, and they were just what we today call a hakal. So it's just uh, timbers that are uh, just uh, really uh, a shack, essentially, and that was it. That was the, the fort. But what this did, this was a really interesting happening because what this did um, was... Oh, here's part of the story. Sorry, I talked my way through it. Um, so here you see the bell during this winter storm in 1686, and then this is the excavation of the bell. Um, we built a coffer dam all the way around the shipwreck. Here you are with the shipwreck down here. It's only 54 by 16 feet across, so it isn't much bigger than some of the uh, boats that you go out in today if you charter a big boat to go fishing. Um, so the coffer dam uh, was set in here. The water, this part of Matagorda Bay, is only 12 feet deep right here. So, um, But they could not dive and do a good excavation. So they did a coffer dam all the way around it. It was really, as Cliff mentioned earlier, it was really an amazing excavation. Uh, what it allowed the Historic Commission to do was truly uh, find many artifacts that you would never find if you were diving, if you were scuba diving. Um, and when you look at this um, photograph, you can see this was all rope that was coiled in here. This was an area that had a lot of cargo. It was in crates and barrels. And then back here were the munitions, okay? So things were really very organized and very, very interesting to find. Um, my boss, who was Dr. Jim Seth, called it a kit for building a colony. So in other words, um, the LaSalle had stacked things in this little ship to be able to set up a colony on land. Whoops. Oh, is that the next one? Okay. Okay, so here I want to tell you about Copano, Copano Bay. And uh, you may have noticed in the title slide I called it um, based on a history cruise. We do a history cruise from uh, the History Center every year, and we'll do one in April or May. I brought a clipboard with me. If you're still here in the area in April and May and would like to know when we're going to do this, well, let me know because it's really fun. But what I'm going to show you today, tonight, is uh, the best I could do with photographs 
with maps that I got from Google and other, other uh, illustrations. So the poor, four areas that I'm going to talk about are going to be, oops, darn. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to talk about, first of all, over here, and this is Copano, okay? Um, and I'll tell you about that. It's right by Mission Bay, but Copano is our oldest, okay? <laughs> The way ships came in here, and some of you may know, you may fish or have been around, we're right here, okay? And so the ships came in the pass, and the most uh, basic channel through Aransas Bay was this way, okay? Only after the federal government came in and built the channel to Corpus did ships go that way. Okay, so the natural channel was to come in through the pass, and then come on down Aransas Bay, and then all the way over here. And why this is so important is this is the closest that you can get to the Spanish missions that were already here in Texas. So you probably realize that water transport is the very cheapest and the very best way you can move anything. And so the Spanish wanted to get as close as they could to those Spanish missions. I'm talking about the Alamo and all that group of um, missions that you had along the San Antonio River. Uh, there were also some in East Texas. So if they didn't use this water route, then they had to come across mountains and across deserts from Mexico uh, to get to this area. So this water route was really, really an important thing for them. Um, so one time I went out with uh, KIII uh, crew on um, this little boat, which is the one we do our history cruise on, and um, we went over to look at this Copano. Um, I guess you can't see it yet. So here we are, and the goal was to get this little drone out over these ruins. These are the ruins of Copano, of the town of Copano. Okay, so there are sort of two um, points to Copano. The first one is from the 1700s, believe it or not. So after the missions were established in the San Antonio area in 1722, um, then they wanted this route. And so um, this fellow who was in charge of all the Spanish uh, outposts at the time declared that this Copano should be the port that would be used by everybody. Now they didn't really set up anything except a customs shack at that point. Um, and so any ship that came in there had to pay some kind of duties. So they were kind of controlling the, the territory, trying, uh, controlling whoever came in to Copano Bay with the goods for their Spanish outpost. But uh, smugglers also used this. And um, so the Spanish were forced to fortify the area. Um, and then, you know, a little bit later in the 1820, when it was Mexico, remember Mexico kicked out Spain, uh, it becomes the Mexican port. And again, it was um, a, a duties uh, area, a customs office was really all that they had there. Sometimes they didn't even have anybody on shore there. Sometimes you would uh, come in there, dock, and you would have to go as far as Goliad or Refurio to find the customs agent. But that was all part of the setup that they were uh, working with. So later, the second round of what goes on at that same location of Copano is that the first Irish immigrants come in. You may not have thought about Irish coming here, but we had um, two fellows who got um, their, their land grant for this area, and that was Power in, in Hewittson. I'll talk more about Power in a minute. So they brought the first Irish settlers in uh, as early as 1829, 1830s. And uh, they came to the same port uh, where the Mexicans and Spanish had been. Then it was really busy during the Texas Revolution. When you look at all of the things that went on uh, during the Texas Revolution, it's amazing they didn't really trip over each other. So first of all, this is um, gonna be in 1835 
in August and September, General Coase came in with 400 infantry. Now, Coase was one of Santa Ana's top generals, and so he was already beginning to fortify the area. Well, actually, he had come to put down what he called the rebels, okay, the Texian rebels, and so he marched on up to Goliad and then over to San Antonio. But then later, it becomes a really important location for other people coming in to help the Texians against the Mexicans. So then by 1836, in January, we have a Georgia company coming in. In March, though, it turns back over to the Mexicans, and we have three different Mexican generals coming in, bringing their troops in there. Then later in March, we have a Nashville company coming in. And uh, of course, then we have the Battle of San Jacinto, and all of the Mexican troops leave to go down across the border, um, except a few. And so General Sam Houston sends Burton uh, to Copano to defend it, to be sure no more Mexicans can come in through this port. And Burton sets up a decoy and decoys a couple of ships, Mexican ships, into Copano. And then his men are able to get on one ship and then they decoy a second ship in. These were huge supply ships that were coming in with more supplies for Santa Ana. And so by capturing them for the Texans, they were able to turn those over to the Texian troops that were uh, pretty, pretty well wiped out by that time and also prevent them from going to the Mexican army, which is in retreat at that point. So most people in most history books don't really relate all of these happenings that are going on in Copano Bay, and it's just great history. It's just really amazing. So here we are by 1841. Um, just to orient you, here we are. We're going in the past. We're going around here. We're going over here to Copano. So you've already, by 1841, you've got Copano located, and then you've got uh, Refurio located. Those were really important areas. Uh, people begin settling a little bit on the islands, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So here we are back um, on the, on the uh, shoreline for Copano, and uh, here we have uh, crumbling ruins. These ruins um, were mapped by uh, Texas A&M University from Kingsville. Uh, they spent a month out there in 2005, and I uh, went along to help them map these ruins. When you look at them, you can see that some of them are along the edge, but this uh, bluff is beginning to fall in, and as it does, all of these ruins crumble. This is the most distinctive ruin that you can see, which was one of the houses here. There were about 200 people who lived along this shoreline. Um, here we see um, a map. This was what was still found in that area in uh, 1935. So you can see all of the houses were, well, you probably can't read it, but all of them were numbered, and then they're labeled down here as to what family had what uh, lot. So we had a main, main uh, set of houses along here. This went back up into uh, Mission River that went up to the mission at Refurio, and then another set uh, was settled down here, okay? So you see a different area, and I'll show you something from that. This was the Plummer settlement over there. Um, so here's one of the buildings that is still sort of standing as ruins, and this gives you a good look at Shellcrete, and some of you who may be from like the Florida or Carolina coast are familiar with Shell Creek. Over on the East Coast, you call it Tabby, okay? So we had the same thing and we call it Shell Creek. You can sort of see it here, but those are oyster shells and this was made uh, with what we call oyster hash. And oyster hash is when the shells have uh, come up to the shore and been crushed and been crushed. And so you have little microchips of shell that hash then is mixed with lime and water and sand to create these blocks. And you can see that there are blocks of Shell Creek that then have been uh, put together for the building. Now, I've talked to restoration architects about how they did this. And I pictured it being done 
uh, as you make adobe. In other words, having a mold that you would pour your slurry into until it dried, and then you would set it up. But I had another architectural restoration uh, fella tell me that they did it by building their framework and then pouring into it, letting it set, and then building another framework. The next set of slurry went in, and then you, you just continued to build it up. Either case, I don't know how many of you have done building like this, but it's awfully damp around here, <laughs> in case you hadn't noticed. So letting the Shell Creek dry must have been a really important part of the whole operation. I wish I could find that restoration architect. And uh, if anybody knows anybody or anybody on the East Coast, I've even contacted National Parks uh, trying to find out exactly how this tabby was made, what the recipe is for it. Because I've had people demonstrate it before, but they just take the old regular bo box of concrete, bag of concrete, and add some oyster shells to it. And that's not what they did. This is uh, shell crate was a definite construction. Um, so here you see the same, this is the, the best room that's over there, so it gets in a lot of pictures. But you can still see, you could see the room outline of this particular house, and then cisterns. So there were a number of cisterns. The reason this um, settled, one of the reasons this settlement did not last is because there was no real water source. So they had to catch all of their water off the roofs and keep it in cisterns. Um, and they even had to go quite a few miles to uh, do their laundry. So they went to a creek that was quite a way from there to even do laundry. So the water source was a real big problem. Now this is a monument that I mentioned for the Plummer family who lived down the way on the slough that's just a little bit uh, east of the main location. Okay, so Aransas City then is the next piece that I'd talk about, and it's right here. So we've come in through the pass, we've come across here, and here we are right here on this peninsula. And um, you may be familiar with it. Um, I'll keep going. Goose Island would be over here, and I'm gonna, I'll show you a little bit about that. But this was called Aransas City. Um, there's certainly no settlement there today. Um, but this is what it looks like today uh, from Google, okay? So you would be coming, if you were coming from Aransas Pass, you'd be coming, uh, you'd be driving north, okay? You're looking south. And um, when you look along here, this again is a bluff. And um, as you look at it, I can tell you this is swampy right here, it's low. And then this whole thing gets higher this is a pretty high bluff right in here, and then it drops off again in this direction. Um, so the settlement that we're talking about here was built on what was called Live Oak Point, and it was called Aransas City, and it was essentially right in here. But again, we had over 100 people living here, um, and we've only been able to find a little bit of the remains of their settlement. This is our impresario, James Power. He was Irish, and um, he had come over to the United States. He lived in Philadelphia to begin with, and then in New Orleans. And then he got word of what was going on in Texas and formed the partnership uh, to gain this uh, impresa, we call it. And he had an agreement with first the Spanish and then the Mexican government to bring in two to 300 Catholic families to the coast. He could bring in Irish, and Mexicans. Now, the reason they wanted to do that was that at this time, there was already beginning to be an influx of Anglos, Protestant Anglos who were coming in, and the Mexican government was threatened by them. So they really wanted to have a buffer. So they were willing to uh, grant this, make this grant to people as long as they would bring in Catholic families so they could have this buffer. And, um, whoops, that was a little bit about um, the area, I know you can't really read that very easily. Uh, this map shows that bluff. This map was, uh, or sketch, was done in 1842, and it shows you just how um, the area looked. This is a map that shows you the pass all the way up here to that point, 
and um, this was made in 1833 by a uh, ship captain so that he could navigate all of the oyster shell, all of the reefs that were actually uh, still out there. So Power uh, set up his, his settlement and uh, there were a lot of, there were stores, there were attorneys, um, a doctor or two, and they did pretty well. Power signed the Texas Declaration of Independence. He was recognized as the leader in the colony. Uh, he spent most of the revolution in New Orleans uh, getting supplies for the Texian uh, army and the fighters there and then came back to this point at Live Oak Point at Moranzas. He was asked by Sam Houston to negotiate with the Indians for peace, which he did, but it only lasted a couple of years. Oh, here's the map. You can see a little bit better. So here we are, just to orient you again. So we're right here tonight. But if you came in the past, then our captain has given you a clear way that you should go so you avoid any of these shoals, any of the uh, really shallow points. And here's Live Oak Point, where Armanza City was located. So uh, people say, how in the world did they bring schooners in there? Well, it was a little bit deeper, but they were also shallow draft, um, if you think about it that way. So this, again, runs down James Power's history. Um, he uh, went to Mexico. He married into a fairly well-to-do Mexican family. And uh, then he was really active as a Texian leader. His Aransas City operated, uh, oh, for about 10 years, maybe 15 years. Um, there's one thing I have to read. I just love this. This is a letter that was written in 1838 uh, by somebody who was staying with Mr. Power. He said, I find this the most pleasant summer residence. The air is delightful. The water is good and sea bathing luxurious. The fish and turtle are most abundant and oysters all around just for picking up. The only annoyance that we have is the incursion of Mexicans and Comanche Indians. Still, this place has somewhat the appearance of business. Three schooners have arrived just since we landed. They're bringing lumber and other merchandise. Um, so that was just part of a letter um, of somebody just relating what it was like to be here. Here's our bluff again. Um, and you can see the houses of Aransas City up here. You can see how the bluff is high right here. Uh, now, luckily, I had a friend who had a house on that bluff, and he started to, he noticed that as the uh, bluff was crumbling, uh, artifacts were falling out, so he began to gather them. And I asked him if we could use them, if he would loan them to us for an exhibit, which he did. And then when he moved to Central Texas, he donated his collection to the History Center. So we have these artifacts from Aransas City. And what you see here is a much more luxurious sort of uh, living area. It's not, a, it's not a log cabin with a dirt floor. It, they were very sophisticated in how they lived in this particular area. Um, and these are my very, very favorite um, objects here, these artifacts. These are wine seals, okay? And this one says it's from St. Estephan, Madoc, France. So um, they were drinking French wines right here on our peninsula in the 1830s. So I looked that up and, and uh, contacted a wine merchant about it one time. And uh, I said, you know, this came from an early settlement in Texas, 1830s. And he said, really, tell me more. And I said, well, the, the Irishman came here, you know, and um, he said, well, who was it? And I said, well, it was James Power. He said, you won't believe that I grew up in Wexford, Ireland. Okay, this wine merchant grew up in Wexford, Ireland, and that's where our fellow Power came from. So... You just never know when you get onto something like that. Um, we also have a, a Texas Navy button. This is a reproduction, but this is what it actually looked like. So we know that somebody from the Navy for the Republic of Texas was there visiting at some point. It's a really wonderful story, and we keep, keep looking for more parts of it. Okay, well, he 
power had competition. And even though he had a fairly going concern here, um, and he later then built over here in that second settlement that I told you about, he had competition across the way at what's called Lamar. And Lamar today is just a, a small community of people. I was talking to somebody before the talk that what they have over there today is a fire department. Uh, they sort of coalesce around supporting the fire department. That's really important, but there's no town, um, no stores, no, nothing like that. But uh, at one point, it was uh, settled by uh, competition. Uh, James Byrne started a settlement over in Lamar. And again, let's see, we uh, have crossed the bridge, okay, um, and we're looking north, okay, we've come across the bridge north, and then we're looking over this way. Goose Island's over here, you'll be able to see it in a minute. But this is where Lamar was all along here, over into here too, and then back in here. Um, there was quite, quite a little town. They had an academy, a school, lots of people sent their kids there, even boarded them. And it was fairly well developed in the mid 1830s. And in fact, uh, here we go. You can see Goose Island, okay, if you're familiar with that. Big tree would be on down this way. Um, this is, the, of course, the area today. Um, this was the way they laid it out. They were very ambitious. James Byrne had a, a great idea for a development and uh, really convinced a lot of people to come join him. He actually ended up with a lot of former captains, sea captains, who came in there. and They were real happy to all gather in that particular area. Um, and he petitioned... Uh, Lamar, who was president, I mean, president of the Republic of Texas at the time, and asked, could we name this little town after you? Well, of course, Lamar said, great. Oh, that's so wonderful. Aren't you nice? And then the next thing that James Burns said was, well, since we've set up this town to honor you, could we also have the customs? Could we have the port where everybody has to come and pay their taxes? Oh, well, you know what that meant. It was at the time over at Aransas City, but Lamar, President Lamar, was so flattered that in fact they did, so they moved the tax uh, office over to Lamar. Uh, the people at Aransas City petitioned and, and did get it back after a while. Um, Lamar was interesting. Um, here we have James Fern. And we have the things that are still over that way. Uh, the main thing is this little chapel that was built in the 1850s. Um, again, it's a Catholic, Catholic chapel that was built right on the water in that area that I showed you. But um, the Catholic diocese decided they wanted to build a different style uh, chapel. And so uh, the historical society got this moved over by a cemetery. But it's one of the sites that you can visit over there in Lamar today. Um, here we have President Lamar, and this is essentially the story that I just related to you, except I didn't get on down to the Civil War. Um, what happens during the Civil War around here is that there were still settlements on the islands, and you may have read about uh, the Union forces coming here and uh, then going across the pass and then on down San Jose Island. Um, and on over to Lamar because Lamar had several salt works. Okay, salt was very important during the Civil War. And um, so we had, um, the, the way they set up their salt works is they had platforms of Shell Creek with a little uh, curbing around them and they pumped water, salt water from the bay onto these platforms and then let it dry and then scooped up the salt. So this was real important. So the Union troops came in there and in fact shell that area and then came in and seized ships and warehouses, but especially they were after the salt works during the Civil War. They didn't do too much damage, but just enough. So it faded um, as Rockport grew uh, after the Civil War. This is just a sketch somebody did about what a sailing vessel at a warehouse might look like. And this is a Shell Creek building that's over in Lamar. Again, this was probably a schoolhouse. It's called the Bunker House. 
and uh, there are two sections to it uh, that butt up to each other like a, a um, sort of like an L shape. During Harvey, one of these walls fell over, just fell down, fell, but it stayed as a consistent piece. And so the owner called us and asked if we wanted it at the History Center. So we took that uh, Shell Creek wall and it's now standing outside at the History Center so you can really see what Shell Creek looks like. Um, another view of that bunker house. And this was a, a sketch, oops, sketch that somebody made of, of that same ruin. And this is Stella Morris Chapel today. Uh, it is a functioning chapel. I believe they have services on Saturday afternoons. Okay, the last a little uh, area that I want to talk about is St. Mary's, which you probably never heard of. And St. Mary's um, is all the way over here. So again, we're coming in the past, we're going around here. By now, this is defunct, this isn't too active. Uh, and people could come all the way around here, um, which again is pretty close to the interior. And this was a port um, that was set up mainly to uh, bring in supplies uh, after the Civil War. Uh, it got started in the 1860s, but it really uh, blossomed uh, during and after the Civil War. Um, we had some notable people from there, uh, a man named Hobby, who's uh, descendants later became governor and uh, lieutenant governor, uh, a different one. And we had another fellow named uh, John Hallam Wood. Oh, excuse me, I skipped the area. This is what it looks like today. So this is Bayside, okay, which again is on the north side of this uh, Copano Bay. And then the St. Mary's area is over this way. Okay, so uh, people find a lot of different artifacts in there. This is uh, a, there was a really good description of what Bayside might have looked like, so somebody did a painting about it. Uh, I love, what I love in here is the windmill, isn't that great? Uh, and of course the wharves that went out. Um, another famous person uh, who was born there was Clara Driscoll. And if you're in the area or been in the area over, over Corpus Christi Way, you know we have uh, a lot of Driscoll uh, uh, benefit, benefits uh, from what Clara Driscoll did. Um, this is essentially the story of St. Mary's. It uh, began in the late 50s, um, and it was developed by a nephew of a former governor. These are some of the people that set up businesses there. They were exporting the cotton, the hides, the tallow, and salt. So we had, again, a series of captains. Um, in town, they had both a Presbyterian and Methodist church, as well as a school. They had what they call barrel house. Anybody know what a barrel house is? Can you guess? Did I see a hand go up? Yeah, it's a tavern, uh, but they just dipped the liquor out of barrels or the uh, whatever, so they were called barrel houses. There was actually a saloon and a gambling house, too. Uh, again, the, the Union raided there, and what really destroyed it, we had two big storms. Um, hurricanes, they weren't named yet, but we had one in 1875. They barely got rebuilt, and another one came in in 1886, and that just kind of uh, wiped out the town. That was about enough as far as they were concerned. Um, now, here's our fellow who's a famous, famous person. It was an area for blockade runners. Uh, here's Clara Driscoll on the bottom. And these are a few artifacts that are in the Refurio County Museum uh, over in Refurio that you can see that people have picked up along the beach and uh, collected that way. Uh, today, you could still see the cemetery. And um, the last thing is the home of John Hallen Wood. And of course, you, this one is not uh, very good because it was an old photograph, but um, Mr. Wood built his home called Bonnie View in 1875. And that, that was it. He had extensive holdings. He had what's sometimes called a widow's walk, but he used that 
to look out over the prairie and see what his workers were doing, what they were doing with both its cotton fields and his cattle. Um, so after Hurricane Harvey, it was in pretty bad disrepair and they got some grants and have been working on it. In fact, it was a hotel at one time and had a big addition on the back, which absolutely separated during Hurricane Har Harvey. But now they're working on it again. They have it up and running and they'll have a Bayside uh, Historical Society meeting there this month. So if anybody's interested in this little house, you can just look up the Bayside Historical Group and uh, the meeting will be in this house, which is really a delightful place to see. Okay, so um, I've given you bookmarks. I come from the History Center for Aransas County and uh, we have uh, exhibits there. We uh, have two things. We have a big gallery that stays out there open all the time with something called Voices from the Past. It's a lot of the story of Rockport, how it was developed, and the artifacts that tell you a lot more of the story. And then we keep another gallery open. Did I? I'm sorry. It, my uh, slide slipped, didn't it? Sideways. Oh, well. Tells you who's awake out there. Okay, if, any, if you noticed. <laughs> oh, you don't have to just turn sideways, okay. Anyway, the exhibit that's up right now um, is called Healing Hands, Healthcare in Aransas County. It's all about doctors and druggists, and especially about drugstores before the big box people came in. It's really a fun exhibit. And so I've given you a bookmark that tells you about our open hours and uh, when you can come visit us over there. And again, if you're going to be around in, um, in April or May and would like to be told about our history cruise that will take you to these different locations, I've got a clipboard on the table. You can sign up for that. Any questions? I have Did I put? Okay. Uh, I'm a local geologist, and for 20, over 20 years I had a light plane. Uh -huh. and from the early 90s until about 2013, I would fly over uh, Copano. And early on, there was, at the end of Copano, which I thought was called El Copano, the closest to the Mission Bay entrance was a huge semicircular thing that looked like a giant cistern, and then it disappeared. Was that a cistern? Uh, that's what I've been told, although I guess we'd have to go back to that detail map yeah. to really analyze that. And I haven't, um, the, the uh, fellow, that did the most history around here is named Husson, S-U-S-O-N, and that map was in his book. I, we'd have to go back and really look at his descriptions. I've been told, I was told when I first moved here that that, um, that piece was part of a cistern. It was huge. It was really large, very imposing. It was gone, it was gone 10 years ago or more. Right, just fell in the water. I mean, that was it. Nobody shored it up. It's on private land, and in fact, um, when we did the excavate, I mean the mapping in 2005, uh, there was so much publicity that the people that own the property didn't give us permission to come back. They just didn't. It's private. They didn't want anybody there, you know. So they essentially shut shut down that. We did a very thorough mapping of what ruins are still there, um, you know, and and said so that was the best we could do. We didn't excavate. Yeah. Interesting. Did you take any photographs? I may. I'm not sure. I'd have to look. I've got thousands of photos on my computer. I might have a photograph of it. I don't know. Oh, I'd love to see that. I'll give you my card. Right. Didn't they, once, in the later times, have a pier actually on the reef for the ships? Exactly. They had parallel oyster reefs that you had to be very careful with. They describe having wharves, and I can't remember if our map has wharves. I could go back to it. Um, the Texas Historic Commission did sonar uh, magnetometer uh, trying to find any remains of the piers and never found any, any locations, unfortunately. I mean, they were just gone by the time they did that, uh, about the same time as the excavation, around 2005. Yeah, neat. Oh, I'll give you my card. I'd love to see any photos you've got. Yeah. Did the Shell Creek provide any kind of insulation? Was it a well? I bet it was, but I don't know. I, I have never read a description of people saying it was especially good for that. But I would think so, because it was like Adobe. I mean, all of those courses are 
are very thick. What am I showing? 18, 24 inches thick, the walls are. Yeah, so I imagine it'd be good insulation. Question? Oh, yeah. It's hard to realize, but they did have glass windows and they had slate roofs at Copano. That's what we're talking about. So they uh, had a pretty good settlement there. Imagine bringing all of that in in the 1840s was the height of this town of Copano. And El Copano was the Spanish early on. So it was called both. Yeah, I try to distinguish between them, between the Spanish El Copano and the town of Copano. You have a question way back there? Were there cemeteries on in these different settlements? Um, there's, that's a good question. There is for St. Mary's. I showed you that one. There is not uh, for Aransas City. Uh, there is for Lamar. There's a very nice cemetery over at Lamar with some uh, 1850s graves in it. And uh, so right by Stella Morris, the chapel that I showed you is a cemetery in Lamar. And it's really pretty interesting. And uh, what was the other? Uh, uh, Copano. Um, when, they, when we did the mapping of the town of Copano, one of the things to do was to go out and the students were sent out to try to find the cemetery because we know uh, of records of, of several hundred people who died. They, a lot of the people who came for Bryce and Ed. Uh, but they looked, there were descriptions of where the cemetery was, you know, of a saloon and, and the crew from you know, Kingsville looked as much as they could through the brush trying to find a, a major cemetery for coming up and never located it. <coughs> but there sh it should be there. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Are, are the salvage remains of LaBelle displayed anywhere? Yes, the, the LaBelle uh, first of all, in Rockport, at the Maritime Museum, you'll see a, a pretty major display. There's a large model of what the bell uh, looked like, and then there are uh, two walls of panels and artifacts on the bell right there over in Rockport at the Texas Maritime Museum. That's the museum that has the lighthouse beside it. Um, but the major... <coughs> Uh, bell artifacts are in Austin, where uh, what happened right about the time that we were doing the excavation, uh, the plans were being laid for a major state history museum, Texas State History Museum. And we even uh, designed that museum with a large uh, uh, dock area so that the ship could be brought in as one piece. Uh, and that's the plan that they had that they thought would happen. But instead, what happened, getting the ship out of the excavation that I showed you, it was taken apart piece by piece. Every piece got tagged with like a cattle tag, if you know about putting tags and cattle ears. But um, every piece got tagged. It got sent to an uh, college station in seawater, because remember this had been in seawater for 300 years, and so you don't just take something out and try to dry it off or do anything, you've got to keep it uh, preserved. And so it was taken in, in big vats up to a and and then they built a big like swimming pool size area, and they cleaned all of the pieces of the ship and started putting it back together in this pool. And then the plan was to take something called polyethylene glycol, which is a petroleum-based uh, substance. And theoretically, this wooden structure uh, would have absorbed that polyethylene glycol, like, like uh, celery. You know how you can crisp up celery back in the Okay, well, then we had some oil, oil supply problems and the price of polyethylene glycol went through the roof so they couldn't keep doing that particular uh, treatment. So they took it back apart and they froze dried it 
problems. Okay, they did a freeze dry on every piece. And then they took it piece by piece to Austin. Remember, it's still all labeled. And not only not only was it labeled at the excavation, it was actually labeled to begin with. Every rib, or they're actually called FedEx, but every rib had a number on it, a Roman numeral number on it. Okay? So in France, where they had built the bell, they had numbered everything because they intended for it to go on the other supply ship just for uh, doing short trips. But then when they realized they needed it, they built it out. But every piece was numbered, already numbered in Roman numerals. It was fascinating. Okay, okay. okay. so here we are. We've got a freeze dry. They take them to Austin, and there's a section of this Texas State Museum where they begin to rebuild it. And they worked on that for a year, year and a half. And now it's a centerpiece in that museum, all put back together. Uh, it's an amazing, amazing display to get up to Austin. Yeah. That's each bus can walk in. Well, how they got that many, one of the major things that they had on the ship were seed beads, those little teeny beads that they traded all the Native American, to all the Native Americans. So there were something like two million beads. So when they start putting out numbers, how many artifacts they have? <laughs> it's a, a little skewed. <laughs> about the human remains. Oh, right. Thank you, Alan. I've got my little coaches over here. <laughs> One of the things, I mean, I wasn't going into the bell, that's a whole other talk, but um, in the area that I showed you that had the rope coiled up in the bow, uh, they found human remains, and uh, they found one and a half of a person. But um, anyway, they analyzed his uh, bones and, and said that, you know, he was a young man, probably in his late 20s, and why he was curled up uh, on the rope, we don't know. Uh, they, when they got him to the lab, you know, they realized that there was still brain matter preserved in his skull. And so they had DNA easily to test with anybody. There's not been anybody who came forward in France, from France, to say, you know, they lost their nephew or brother or something like that. It would be very interesting. Um, the French did not want the skeleton back, and so he's buried in the state cemetery in Austin. Okay. Um, what the French said was, well, he wanted to go to the New World. He can stay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um,
somewhat dictatorial in his management of people and had, you know, some enemies, as it were. Personally, I think he's a pretty brilliant man. If you think about him coming to New Canada, New France, down the Mississippi, back up the Mississippi, back to France, getting his four ships, coming over. Well, anyway, um, so after the bell is sunk and they're, they're marooned, I mean, there's no way to do anything except to get to the Mississippi River and go part, partly to back to New France. Well, LaSalle had a partner who had already set up a trading post called the Arkansas Post in Arkansas on the Mississippi River. So they weren't going to have to go all the way back to Canada. That, they knew that, okay? So they start off, and he made several forays around Texas, just kind of looking over things. But this time, he's sure he has to go back east. So they start off um, and end up in East Texas. 20, 20 men start off from the little colony. He leaves about 25 people at the colony, but he goes off with about 20 men. And uh, one night where they're camped, uh, part of the party goes out to hunt, and they, they don't come back right away. And so LaSalle is wondering what's happened with them. Um, along on this group that's the hunters is his nephew who's gone out there. And he was sort of a haughty person too. Um, what happened with this group, were five, I don't remember how many, five or six hunters, is that they got into an argument and they shot the nephew. And so they realize they're really in trouble now. And so then when LaSalle comes looking for them from the main camp, they immediately ambush him. Okay? And supposedly strip him and throw him into the bushes. And then this group of six guys haven't finished yet. Two more get killed. And I think only one, maybe two, come out of it. Okay? And then they go back with the main group. The main group hikes on up to some Caddo villages, stays there for a little while. Some, people, some of the guy and Frenchmen stay there, and then others march on over to the Mississippi River and get back to the Arkansas coast. So seven of those 20 make it back to France. But the story that fascinates me above all else are the children that were part of this French colony because um, the, the name of the family was the Toulon family, and then there was one boy from another family. But during the time that they were with the colony, uh, LaSalle took the oldest of the Talon brothers and, and left him with the Caddo village so that he could begin learning the, the Indian languages and be um, really a, a go-between forum. And then the others were left with their mother at the settlement. So now we've got LaSalle and his band off hiking back to the Mississippi River and um, the Karanko Indians come to the fortress and massacre everybody at the fortress. But they save the children. So they take uh, three Talon children and another one uh, back to their villages. Then the Spanish know that the French are there and they've, they've sent out 11 expeditions to try to find the French. And finally they do come upon them massacre happened around Christmas and the Spanish come in and find them uh, in April and uh, several skeletons are still uh, clothed and in the bushes so they buried those guys and then uh, the Spanish have been told by the Indian alliances that there are other Frenchmen and other French children around the area. So the Spanish gather up the French children and take them back to Veracruz where their headquarters was at the time. And then that fella starts off to back to Spain and they get intercepted by the French. <laughs> <laughs> and so those children end up back in France and they do, you know, a deposition of them. And then two of the brothers end up being on the next French expedition that comes to the New World. They end up on the, the uh, expedition that settles Mobile and then New Orleans. Isn't it an amazing story? Yeah. And it's just fascinating. And, you know, a lot of it was just within a hundred miles of the river. So I hope you'll keep looking and, and learn more of our Texas history.
Let's have another round of applause for the band. Next week we'll have the, the uh, chief uh, officer at the Coast Guard giving a talk about the history of the Coast Guard.